couple of things to share with you real quickly. Uh, Judy Shellhays, where are you this morning? Happy birthday to you today. We, uh, we congratulate you. And Margie Fish has a birthday tomorrow. Margie, where'd, where'd you get to? There you are back there. Okay. Uh, Margie has a birthday tomorrow, and Melcina Napier has a birthday, I believe, on Wednesday of this week. So three of our precious ladies uh, getting a year older. I'm <laughs> Congratulations. I pray you have a blessed day on, on that day of all days. I appreciate so much your prayers and kind expressions, cards, calls, so many things. The other day, Cindy Stack came by. It wasn't her first visit, but she came and brought us some things that she thought we might enjoy, and indeed we did. And um, while she was there, she shared with me that she wrote a little poem. If we could bring up the uh, PowerPoint. She's going to read it to you, but you'll get to see it on the screen as well. So, Cindy, come and share with us, if you will. Oh, she'll need the mic. Now? Now, please. Recently, when Pastor John shared with us Brenda's illness, he told us that the thing that was going through his mind for some unexplained reason were the words of that old Ray Stevens song, A Fight for Survival That Broke Out in Revival. And it's those words that have been in my mind too. And God gave me these words for Pastor John and Brenda and for us, church family. A fight for survival that broke out in revival, this has now become our battle cry. As we tell the story, God will get the glory, and on his promises we will rely. Challenges do face us, heartaches, they do chase us, but only God knows how it all fits in. He alone can do it. He will get us through it. For with his help, the battle we will win. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Well said. Thank you. And Brenda is better today, and I am grateful to be able to share that she, uh, she didn't need a babysitter this morning. Um, the last few Sundays, I've been afraid to leave her alone, and, and uh, so she is... She is responding some. She's been able to take some of the oral chemo this week. And um, so we do appreciate your prayers. But there are other folks who are depending upon our prayers. Uh, Paulette Meyer remains at Mercy South. Um, I sent out a, a message last night about answered prayers uh, for several folks that are doing better. Jerry Smith, Bob Walbuser. Bob's here this morning. We're grateful for that. Um, Pat Rice has gone from the hospital where she had knee replacement surgery. She's now in therapy down here at Bethesda. Uh, and then we got word just this morning that Howard Bennett had been taken to Missouri Baptist Hospital, and Howard has been diagnosed with pneumonia, which is a very serious threat. Uh, Howard already has some serious breathing issues, and they have admitted him to the hospital. So uh, we certainly want to be in prayer for him. And then, as many of you already know... Um, Forrest Buchanan, who is one of our dear friends and members, uh, lost his son this past Wednesday. Both of his sons live with Forrest, and the younger son, Ron, who was 44 years old, was ill on Wednesday, and Wednesday afternoon, his sister came by the house and went in to check on him, and he had died in his bed. And so you can only imagine the tragedy and the sadness that they're dealing with. There will be a memorial service here in our church this coming Friday morning at 11 o'clock, and I have sent out a message last night. We do need uh, three or four volunteers as pallbearers. So if any of you men might be able to be available Friday morning, see me later about that. But certainly we want to be in prayer for all of these folks. And as I said, I appreciate your prayers for Brenda, but certainly for Forrest and his family in the burden they bear just now. There are times in our lives when we get to a point where we can do nothing but pray. And yet praying is the most powerful thing we can do. Let's do. 
Dear God, our Heavenly Father, in this moment we pause and we ask, Lord, that you would just be present as you are in this room, in those places where people we love are hurting and healing. We thank you, Lord, for the evidence of answered prayers and the encouragement to keep praying. And indeed, Lord, help us that we will keep that passion of trust in talking to you about those we love. We pray you'll be with Forrest and his family, with the other folks that we've mentioned this morning and still others that are on our printed list that we've not taken time to mention. They are dear to us and their needs are very real. Your power is sufficient to meet those needs. And so we appeal to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about the character of Christmas, and we appreciate it. One of these days, we'll let you play a hero part. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I determined that we were going to need a villain for this morning, I don't know why, but I just thought of Rich. So, um, well done, by the way, my friend. Thank you for that. But the character of love, and this morning particularly, I want to speak with you about God so loving the world. This is our second Sunday of Advent, and, and as I said, the theme is the character of Christmas. And over the course of the next three weeks, we will light all of the candles, uh, including the Christ candle, the center candle, and we'll light that one on Christmas Eve, at our Christmas Eve service uh, on that afternoon. So it is simply a way to mark the time of anticipation of the coming of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so... This morning, I want to think about the character of love. And let me give you just three simple thoughts to think about. In the first place, we're talking about God's love. It is universal. As I think about God so loving the world, and as I stand here and look out at all of your faces, I thank God that I don't have to pick and choose who I can say God loves you to. Okay? I can, I can say that without reservation, without hesitation, Without question, God loves you. And you, yeah, and you can say amen to that because that's true, okay? Now, here's something else about the love of God. It is unceasing. Sometimes people we love test our love. John made the comment in his testimony earlier about getting married and then you have to make a living. You also have to make a loving, see. Sometimes it takes work, doesn't it, to love people. But true love does not know an end. We do not cut it off or we do not turn it on and off as though it were a lamp. It is unceasing and certainly God's love for us. And finally, it's unending. And I'll say a little more about that as we go along. But I want to share with you a verse from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known to us as the weeping prophet because he was the prophet in Jerusalem who literally watched Jerusalem fall around his ears to the Babylonians. Jeremiah was one of those who fled to Egypt to get away from the Babylonian captivity and he died in Egypt. He was never to return to see his beloved Jerusalem. But hear what God said to Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, 1. And when you think about the character of love, universal, it is unceasing, it is unending. And that's exactly what God said to Jeremiah. You're very familiar with the verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life life. Think about that for just a moment, because that includes you. See, occasionally, especially when I'm talking with a child about making a profession of faith, I will use that verse and suggest that they substitute for the phrase, the world, their name, because it's no less true. And you can do that this morning. Put your name in there, for God so loved John, See, even when John isn't so lovey. Bethlehem simply is one example of God so loving the world. This is the 
what's called Manger Square in Bethlehem. Some of us had a chance to visit that a few years ago. And uh, it's, it's just a big open plaza, but they believe that that's where the inn was. Uh, it's torn down, kind of like the Holiday Inn on Butler Hill. It's not there anymore. But anyway, they have built a, a church called the Church of the Nativity. And uh, I'm going to try to show you here. See this little black hole? That's the entrance to the Church of the Nativity. And if you can notice the automobile that's right here, that door is designed so that you have to bend down to walk through. That was intentional. And then what this is a picture of is actually a star that's down in a grotto when you go inside the Church of the Nativity, believed to be, claimed to be, the very site where the manger lay. And so when you think about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and how indeed love came down at Christmas when God sent His Son into our world. And so, and you've heard this I'm sure before, there, uh, there are three words in the New Testament that translate our English word love, phileo, eros, and agape. And agape is the one that we focus on because that's God's love. When it says, for God so loved the world, God so agaped the world, or actually agapeo the world, means simply that God loved the whole world one person at a time. You say, wow, how can that be? I can't do that, but God can. Now the other two words... Phileo means brotherly love or kindness, okay? When we did our greeting a while ago, some of you went around, spoke to each other, greeted each other. That's phileo kind of love in the family of God. Eros, that's appetite love. We sometimes associate it with physical appetites, uh, sexual appetites. But in reality, if I love ice cream, that's eros, see? Anything that satisfies my selfish desires, my selfish pleasures, is referred to as erotic or eros kind of love. Agape is unique in that it is love that is giving, not taking. My hope and prayer is that in our church, in our families, in our homes we would know agape more than eros or even phileo because one is simply greeting and the second is taking, but only the third is giving kind of love. And so, like hope we talked about last week, notice that it's both a noun and a verb. The Apostle Paul said, but now faith, hope, love, abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, I've added a phrase at the bottom. Think about this for a moment. Love is the only one of the three that survives in heaven. No need to hope in heaven because reality has come. No need to have faith in heaven because faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. When we get to heaven, it's there. So we won't need faith in heaven, and we won't need hope in heaven, but we will experience love like you cannot imagine in heaven. Love invites. One of the curious things about love, and I don't know if you noticed, I put a footnote on one of the earlier slides, that love requires a recipient. Now here's the thing, I can have faith, but I don't need to have someone, you know, except God, of course. And I can have hope, and hope is kind of general. But if I have love, that requires a recipient, see. Sometimes people will claim, I'm a very loving person, and they don't help anybody. <laughs> you know, that's not true, see. Love, real love, agape kind of love, requires a recipient. So Paul says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love, His agape toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, at a time when we were not very lovely, God chose to love us. 
Now, love also involves. Love is not something you watch. It's not a spectator activity, in other words. Love is something you involve yourself in. Love is something that you do. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus declared, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's why we celebrate Advent, because we anticipate the giving of God's unspeakable gift and the sacrifice that goes beyond all sacrifices that Jesus made for us. Now, some of you note, as I did yesterday, December 7th. There are some dates in our lives that are more painful than others, aren't they? We remember birthdays, anniversaries, good times. Unfortunately, there are some sad times that also stay on our calendar year after year after year. And so if you ever go to Honolulu, you will almost certainly go and visit the Arizona Memorial. But here's the third thing about love. Love invigorates. It's not blind. You know, have you ever heard the expression, love is blind? No, it isn't. I've done weddings for 53 years. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I see two people standing in front of me saying they will love each other till death do they part, and I don't see what they see in each other. <laughs> That's the, now, not you guys, not present company, okay? <laughs> but the, hon the honest truth is, what in the world do they see in each other? And how many of you are here that if you were totally honest, either your mama or your daddy pulled you aside a few days before your wedding and said, are you sure you want to do this? Why? Because they couldn't see what you saw in the person you were choosing to spend the rest of your life with, and they didn't want you to make a terrible mistake. Now, there ought to be at least 53 amens at this point in this service. Shame on you for being so, so silent at this point, you know, because that's true. Here's the thing. Love is not blind. True love sees a worth that others don't see. True love sees the value in someone that others cannot be aware of. And that's what God sees in us. God's love invites. Edwin Markham wrote a beautiful poem one time. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the, the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. And see, that's exactly what God did and exactly what Paul acknowledged in that while we were yet sinners, we had drawn a circle and shut God out. He drew a bigger circle that takes us in. So there is no one here this morning that God does not see something in you that you may not even see in yourself. Why in the world? Would God love me? Do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you know what my life has been like? And friend, I can say to you absolutely, unequivocally, it does not matter. Because God sees worth in you that maybe even you yourself can't see. Jesus said it this way over in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, notice that, anyone, love is universal, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. That's the invitation that God's love provides and Jesus' sacrifice makes possible. Rich portrayed earlier, no room. I ask you, is there still no room for Jesus Christ? So the character of love 
And it may be for you this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, is to make room for Him in your heart. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, and in this moment, Lord, we just pray and ask that you might speak to each of our hearts. And Lord, there may be someone here this morning, and they're struggling because they don't feel so loved. Maybe because of what they're enduring, the sadness, the burden, the heartache, the trouble they're going through, they just wonder if God so loving the world really does mean them too. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit might give them an assurance that you've loved them with an everlasting love that is just as true today as it's been ever before. Father, if there's someone here who just has not experienced that love because they've not invited Jesus Christ into their life, I pray that perhaps this morning would be the time they would make room and say, yes, Lord, yes. I accept your love to me, and I love you too. There are others, Lord, who have needs or burdens this morning. Can they bring them to you? And even while we're singing, may our song become a prayer of appeal that we would seek you even while you are seeking us. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, and as we sing a brief hymn of invitation, if you have a need to come, I bid you come in Jesus' name. Thank you for being here this morning, a part of our service. We've had several things that we wanted to address and needed to take care of this morning, so I appreciate your patience with it. And I didn't have time after Sunday school to get by to greet folks like I normally try to do, and I didn't discover until, frankly, while I was preaching, Don Wolf, that you and your daughter are with us this morning. Welcome today. For those who maybe don't know or, or had not met him, we had the funeral for Don's wife, Judy, precious lady, retired nurse. She worked at St. Anthony's during her career, and uh, Don and his daughter are here. God bless you both. We're glad you're here this morning, and our prayers continue for you. As we go to the Lord together in our prayer, remember tonight is our business meeting, and there are three things in particular I want you to be aware of tonight. As I mentioned earlier this morning, we have two men that have been in training for a year as deacons and will be voting tonight whether or not to proceed with ordaining those men. We also will be acting out, or acting on, excuse me, not acting out, acting on our proposed budget for next year, our ministry plan for 2020. And then we'll be hearing a report from the vision team this evening. And uh, they've been in negotiation with the architect and a contractor since our last meeting. So they'll have an update that I think you'll want to hear. That's at 6 o'clock this evening. Hope you can join us. Bring some desserts or whatever, uh, and, uh, and we'll enjoy some food and fellowship together and then have our quarterly business meeting. That's, again, at 6 o'clock this evening. To folks who have been watching the service, those on Facebook or on our live feed, we're grateful that they're able to join us. And, uh, by the way, uh, I looked last week, and they had a live feed of the service, the whole service, and then they had a live feed of just the sermon. Well, I pulled up the sermon part, and it was only 22 minutes. <laughs> so if you're looking this morning at what time it was, you owed me eight minutes, okay? <laughs> Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for all of your blessing. We thank you certainly for your love. Lord, we cannot exhaust the expanse of your love for us. And it gives God so loving the world such a power, such a force in our lives. And Lord, I acknowledge there are some days we need your love even more than other days. Thank you for sometimes channeling that love through others whom you love as well. And that you send your love by their love. Lord, we pray once again for those in our church family who carry the burden of sorrow, those who carry the burden of illness, those who need and are seeking healing. God, we know you are sufficient. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for being there for us. We pray in Jesus' name. And the people said,